test one, two. Well, it is very nice to finally be here at the Iowa State. It was the fall of 1990, in fact, when I was uh, going to come, planning to come. And uh, in actual fact, I was not in Nicaragua, Jeff. I was in um, Madrid, where I lived at the time. Uh, it happened that um, these conditions had been laid on by the Bush administration for the release of the, um, of the aid which Nicaragua needed so desperately. And uh, one of the conditions was the revocation by the Chamorro government of my passport. And I had been waiting for something to happen ever since the elections in uh, February and the, um, uh, the taking of office by Violeta Chamorro as president in uh, May, I believe it was, of 1990. Nothing happened, and uh, uh, as part of the uh, organization and the peace movement in the United States uh, to oppose the coming war in the Gulf, uh, I was going to be traveling around for about eight weeks <coughs> here, uh, going to different places, including uh, coming here. But um, about five days, I think it was, before I was to leave and come over here to the States from uh, Madrid, I had a call from New York from a friend <coughs> in the Nicaraguan mission to the United Nations. And he told me he had just seen a diplomatic circular which had gone around to all the Nicaraguan missions, uh, informing them that my Nicaraguan passport had been uh, invalidated. And so I had to cancel that trip because I didn't have a document to get back into Spain at the end of the trip. They can't keep me out of the United States. I don't need a passport to come in. And the passport question is interesting because it shows you the type of power that the government has. Uh, in 1979, uh, just after the beginning of the hostage crisis in Iran, the Carter administration revoked my passport. The actual revocation had to be signed by the Secretary of State, who was then Cyrus Vance. But the man who was really responsible is the current Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, because he was the point man on Iran during the um, crisis for the Carter administration. Uh, that didn't mean I couldn't travel, though, because early on, just weeks after my passport, my US passport was revoked, I received a letter from uh, Morris Bishop the leader of the Grenadian Revolution. And this letter was an invitation to go to the first anniversary celebrations of the Grenadian Revolution, the overthrow of the Gary dictatorship there. And uh, with that letter, he sent me a Grenadian passport. And so I had a passport from Grenada uh, to travel all over Western Europe, to the Caribbean, Central America. I used it to go to Canada also. And it happened that at the moment of the invasion of Grenada, the Bush, uh, Reagan Bush invasion, I was at a solidarity conference in Managua. In fact, I gave a speech on behalf of the US delegation to this conference. And uh, I spoke to the Sandinistas at the time. I said, you know, uh, as soon as Reagan can get a caretaker government put in down there, uh, they're surely going to invalidate my Grenadian passport. And they say, told me, of course they will and uh, we know you need a document to travel. We want you to be able to come back here to uh, Nicaragua often. I had already been there many times. I worked quite closely with them to um, prepare the defenses for, uh, that they needed for, the, uh, for their own protection against the CIA operations, which were surely coming there, like the Contras and various other things. And uh, they said, we uh, want you to be able to come back. We know you have to have a document. We're going to give you a Nicaraguan passport. So they gave me a Nicaraguan passport. And uh, I went back to Spain. Then I came back um, on the uh, first uh, coffee picking brigade, remember, that started up um, in December of 1983. And then I was back uh, from time to time after that. Uh, in any case, that travel document problem finally was resolved. I now have uh, something from the Germans which is known as a Reise document or a travel document. It's not a passport, but it gets me back into Germany. And so each time when I come to the States, I land at Kennedy, or this time it was Atlanta, and um, I give this little card to the uh, immigration inspector, and I have to go back to the office and fill out a form. It's been going on now for six years, and I must have filled out uh, 20 of these forms. It's got full of blocks, 
it's a whole page size, and it's your name, date and place of birth, where you live, uh, what your occupation is, why you don't have a document, why you don't have a passport, and um, what flight you came on, that kind of thing. At the very bottom, in bold, it says, I promise to pay within 30 days the sum of $100 for this waiver. It's a waiver for the, to the regulation that requires a valid passport to come into the country. And uh, so I have to fill that out in order to go on and take another flight or to go into the city if it's New York, whatever. whatever. And uh, from the very start, though, uh, I knew that was illegal because Bill Worthy, uh, who's been very active in solidarity matters, uh, he lives near Boston, uh, his case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that the government cannot charge a U.S. citizen to come into the country. And so what I do is, uh, to the consternation of these officials, because they cannot stand to have their forms defaced, you know, I write on the diagonal all across it like that. I say, this is illegal, this is unconstitutional, I will never pay $100. And I always put my lawyer's office uh, on Park Avenue in New York <coughs> as the place they should collect. As I'm riding across, without, without exception, these people are standing like this. They can't believe that I would do this to their form. And uh, I can just see them getting nervous. I don't even look up at them. I just do it, and I know what they're going through. And um, it's kind of a game. But anyway, uh, the point of the story is that they have never tried to collect one time that $100, even though every time I've, I've had to sign it just to get going, because they know also that it's, uh, that it's unconstitutional, that it's illegal. Well, anyway, um, I want to clarify one thing uh, about what Jeff said uh, just now, and that is about the exposures of the CIA's operations and personnel. Um, I can, this could be a long story, but I'm going to make it very short. And that is that early on, when I decided to write a book, I decided on my own that uh, it would not be enough simply to describe what the CIA does, but it would be additionally very important to include the people who do these things abroad, meaning the local people where their names are available, the CIA people, and so forth. It was not exposure, by the way, for the sake of simple exposure of secrets or people who are working secretly, not at all. There was a purpose to this, and that was to provide a better understanding, <coughs> excuse me, a better understanding of what we do abroad as a nation, a society, a country. Because a country's foreign policy is based, is a direct product of its domestic system. And one way that we can understand our domestic system in the United States better is to understand as well as possible what we do abroad, and especially the secret things that we do abroad, the things that the government doesn't want people to know about. And that is the purpose of the exposure of what the CIA does and the people who do it. Uh, I think that's an important thing because uh, there's been a lot of controversy around the exposure that I have made, and I want people to understand the, uh, the purpose of it from the very beginning. Well, I come to you tonight as a person who worked in the CIA for almost 12 years and who did a lot of damage to Cuba and the Cuban Revolution. Uh, I spent uh, eight years, no, yes, eight years practically in Latin America, and uh, I was working most of that time against Cuba and the Cuban presence in Latin America and also their supporters throughout Latin America. But the good news is that my ideas about U.S. foreign policy and the role of the CIA changed. And for more than 20 years now, I have been working actively in solidarity with Cuba. Not only with Cuba, with, with some of the African movements, with Nicaragua, Grenada, and so forth. And what I've tried to do is put my experience at their disposal to, so that they could better protect themselves from these types of activities, which I'm going to describe right now. Uh, one of the ways to understand the CIA, and a very good way to understand the situation in Latin America, is to examine the case of Cuba. The revolution, uh, which Jeff mentioned in 1953, was not an isolated event. In fact, it wasn't really even a revolution. It was the beginning of a revolution, in a sense, and it was the continuing 
continuing of a revolutionary tradition that goes back very far. In Cuba, you know, the, uh, the 18th century elite, the educated elite, were affected uh, by the ideas of the Enlightenment, just like the founding fathers in the United States. And in the Spanish colonies uh, in uh, the Western Hemisphere, Mexico, Central America, South America, uh, liberation movements or independence movements developed. And by 1820, 1825, almost all the former, Sp all the Spanish colonies were uh, independent. They had defeated Spain militarily. Not so with the case of Cuba and Puerto Rico. The Span Spaniards were able to retain control and power in those two islands. And where Cuba is concerned, the United States was quite happy that Cuba continued to be a colony of Spain. The fear in the United States at that time was, and this is in the first half of the, of the 19th century, uh, was that Cuba might become a haven for runaway slaves from plantations in the South. Uh, you know, the first presidents were all from the southern uh, states, and uh, the, the uh, administrations in Washington under these southern presidents uh, was, were quite content to see Cuba remain a colony of Spain. Uh, I think it was Madison, wasn't it? I, or was it? It could have been Monroe. I think it was Madison who uh, made the famous statement about uh, Cuba eventually falling into the Union like a ripe fruit. Um, in the 1850s, I think it was, the United States offered to buy Cuba from Spain, and the price they offered was so low that the Spaniards considered it an insult and uh, continued their colonial administration. There was a 10-year war for independence in Cuba, begun in 1968, uh, very famous, uh, man now released his slaves and began a 10-year uh, struggle for independence, which failed and it ended in defeat. But then along came Jose Marti, the father of Cuban independence, really the recognized figure now. And uh, he had been cracking stone in a Spanish prison for his uh, independence activities as a student. He eventually served his time, was released, came to the United States, uh, organized uh, a political movement, a political party called the uh, Cuban uh, Revolutionary Party, and uh, they determined to recommence the struggle for independence from Spain. And so Martí and the others, they land in 1895 uh, to begin this independence struggle again. Within about a month, Martí is dead, killed by, in battle by the Spaniards. And uh, the struggle then goes on until finally they have the Spanish defeated by 1898. But that's the uh, point where McKinley and the um, uh, Hearst Press decide they need a war. And uh, they send the battleship Maine down to make a port call in Havana. There, there's a mysterious explosion. It blows up. Hundreds of sailors are killed. It goes to the bottom. And uh, then the Hearst papers uh, trumpet the need for a war against Spain, and they get it. Uh, the U.S. intervenes in the war and uh, provides the end blow against the Spaniards. Uh, the Cubans had already defeated them. But uh, then the uh, U.S. Army took over the island. In fact, at the end, they wouldn't even allow the Cuban uh, uh, rebel forces or independence forces to go into the cities with the defeat of the Spanish and the withdrawal of the Spanish. They had wanted no manifestation of Cuban nationalism. And so the US military occupied Cuba for four years, from 1898 to 1902. And in 1902, they granted a kind of pseudo-independence to Cuba uh, with a constitution that included a uh, clause called the Platt Amendment, named after Orville Platt, the senator, who had gotten this through Congress as a condition for independence. The Cubans had to write into their constitution that the United States of America has the right to unilaterally intervene in Cuba at any time it wishes for the protection of US lives and property or simply for the restoration of order. The Cubans lived with this humiliation for about three decades, until the 1930s at least, uh, when it was they adopted a new constitution without that flat amendment. But Cuba, in the meantime, was converted into a kind of a floating plantation for the United States. One of the uh, principal 
presences in Cuba from the United States was the Mafia. Uh, others were in uh, agriculture and industry. The best and the biggest landed properties were U.S. owned. Uh, most of the sugar mills were U.S. owned. The cane fields were U.S. owned, the plantations. Uh, the utilities, the uh, transportation, electricity, um, uh, telephones, all of these were owned by the United States. U.S. banks were in there, like the uh, uh, Citibank from New York, which was all over Latin America. Uh, this was a situation in the early 1950s when a young lawyer, Fidel Castro, organized a new independence movement which had a very definite program, including a, a, a genuine uh, independence from the United States. And uh, the first blow in that was the assault on Moncada. Uh, many of you, um, I'm sure, know this history, but I'm going to re review it very quickly for those who don't. Uh, Fidel organized a group of about 120 people, including two women, uh, and they thought they might be able to spark an uprising all over Cuba against the military dictatorship of the time. It was led, this military dictatorship, by a former military officer, Fulgencio Batista, who had overthrown the civilian government in 1952, uh, a government headed by a president called Car Carlos Prio. Uh, at the, uh, the attack came on the 26th of July of 1953, and everything that could go wrong went wrong. Fidel's Buick stalled and a lot of other things happened, and in 30 minutes it was all over. Uh, total failure. Uh, the Batista forces uh, took a lot of them captive. In the first couple of days, uh, he executed 61 of the group, and uh, the church intervened to save the others, including Fidel. They were put on trial, sent, uh, convicted and sentenced uh, to long prison terms. Fidel got 15 years, I think. But his defense, he was his own defense lawyer, his defense of himself at the Moncada trial became one of the classic political statements of Latin American history. Uh, it, is, it is called, the English tran translation of it is, history will absolve me. And in this he quoted from the Greeks, he quoted from Thomas Aquinas, he quoted from the Enlightenment philosophers, on the right of an oppressed people to revolt against tyranny. And, um, Later on in prison on the Isle of Pines, this is this large island south of the western part of the island, uh, he rewrote his defense statement on little pieces of cigarette paper and smuggled them out to his supporters on the outside. And they eventually put it all together in uh, a unified, uh, coherent way. And it became a book. And it is still one of the most widely sold books in Cuba. I mention it because the whole program of the Cuban Revolution is contained in this defense statement. The independence from the United States, the social justice provisions, the rights of women, for example, the end to racism, the availability of education to everyone equally, the expansion of medical services to apply to or to be available to everyone. All of these programs of the Cuban Revolution are in there. Agrarian reform is another one. And so everybody knew what the uh, movement stood for once Fidel's speech was circulated. And um, the movement itself became known as the 26th of July movement after the date of the assault on Moncada. Well, the supporters of Fidel and the others on the outside organized an amnesty campaign. And within less than two years from the assault on Moncada, they were all free. And with, that's May 1955. And then a couple of months later, the uh, leadership with Fidel are in Mexico in exile. And there they continue to plan and to train and to acquire weapons and get money. It happens that in uh, September of 1956, just a couple of months after I had graduated from the University of Notre, University of Notre Dame, Fidel swam across the Rio Grande, uh, disguised as a wetback. Uh, he swam over to McAllen, Texas, where he met with Carlos Prio, the former president, the one who had been overthrown by Batista. And Prio, Prio by then had become a very rich man. He was a super millionaire worth 50 to 100 million dollars. Uh, it had all come from payoffs from the mafia and from other forms of graft. 
In any case, uh, by the time their conversation ended, Priel had agreed to give Fidel $100,000. Fidel swam back to Mexico, and then with that money, which eventually arrived, uh, they continued to buy weapons, and they bought a yacht, which they would use to sail back to Cuba to reinitiate the struggle against the Batista dictatorship, which was, of course, supported by the United States. Well, my life has been entwined with Cuba since I was a child, because uh, in Tampa, Florida, where I grew up, in the 19th century, there had developed an important cigar manufacturing industry. It was an offshoot of the Cuban cigar industry. M almost all of the tobacco came from Cuba. And my playmates as a child were the children of, of, of uh, some of them of the cigar factory owners. <clears throat> I had a very privileged childhood. My father was a successful businessman, and it was kind of like a cl country club atmosphere in which I grew up. Uh, our house, the back backyard, backed onto the green of the exclusive golf club of Tampa, of course, of which we were members. And my sister and I went to the uh, best private schools. We had all the privileges. And um, with a background like that, there can be, uh, you can understand how I might have gone into the CIA after university. But uh, what happened was uh, a couple of months before I was to graduate and get my undergraduate degree, the CIA sent a recruiter out to talk to me and asked me to um, to join. I declined for the moment because I was going to go into law school. But uh, that, didn't, uh, that didn't last for very long because the draft was about to get me. What happens is, also in 1956, the CIA established for the Batista dictatorship a secret police. It was known as BRAC, B-R-A-C. BRAC uh, are the Spanish initials for Bureau for the Repression of Communist Activities. That was a good cover because in actual fact, Batista used this secret police, which became very famous for its torture and uh, murders, political murders. Batista used it for the repression of all of his political opponents, not just communists. Well, the BRAC was organized just about that time when I graduated from college and, uh, and uh, when Fidel had swum the Rio Grande and gone back. And uh, they found in Mexico a yacht uh, on the coast, uh, the Gulf Coast of Mexico, a yacht called Grandma. <clears throat> and this yacht was owned by an American who lived in Mexico City, and Fidel paid him uh, $20,000 for the yacht. Uh, it needed a lot of work because after a hurricane a couple of years before, it had gone to the bottom and it had stayed down there for quite some time. They eventually raised it, but it needed a lot of work before they could use it to uh, sail for uh, Oriente Province, all the way to the extreme eastern end of, of the island. They were working on it, but they had to leave precipitously because the Mexican authorities started to close in on them. Uh, they had a couple of defectors. Batista was on to what they were planning to do, and he had started maritime and air patrols over that area between Mexico and, um, and Cuba. And so one night in late November 19. Uh, 56, sorry, yeah, 56, they sailed from Tuxpan on the Mexican coast in a storm. And the voyage to uh, Oriente, to Cuba, was one nightmare, continuous nightmare of seasickness, of diarrhea. The food ran out. The water ran out. They would, uh, because of the storms, they were two or three days late getting where they, to where they were going, and it ended in a shipwreck. Uh, they, instead of landing up the coast where they were supposed to, they landed several miles away on uh, a gr ground on a mud flat. And so they all had to get out of the boat and walk through hip deep uh, mud, leaving all their weapons and stores behind. And on shore, they were swallowed up in an enormous mangrove swamp. It looked, all, it looked just like Moncada all over again. Well, they survived and got out of that swamp, and in the end, of the 82 who sailed on the Grandma, only 12 regrouped with Fidel. The others were either killed or captured because Batista's army and air force were on them from the very beginning. Uh, 82, by the way, sailed, I mentioned. And the boat, which was built of wood in 1944, I think, was built to hold a maximum of 25 people. So you can imagine how it was with 82 with all these weapons and so forth and stores. Well, they eventually regrouped these 12 men, and they made it up into the Sierra Maestra Mountains on the southern, southeastern coast of Cuba. 
These were 12 men beginning a struggle against an army of 40,000. I mention all this because it's quite incredible that they were able to survive and do what they did, that is, defeat this army. But within two years, they had um, conquered the, uh, the, or they achieved the, uh, the support of the peasantry of the mountains and of Oriente province, and all sorts of people came to join them out there in the mountains. They came down out of the mountains in 1958, and by December of that year, they had Batista pretty well defeated. Well, I made my first trip to Cuba in January 1957, just not even quite one month after they had landed at, uh, in Oriente with the Granma. And already in Havana, where I had savored the uh, Cuban music and the food and the dance and so forth, and uh, the vice as well. Uh, and I remember very well from that trip the presidential palace where Batista worked and lived. Uh, it was surrounded with barbed wire, gun emplacements, uh, sandbags, and so forth. Um, well, that was the um, thing that really put me into the CIA because I came back from that trip, my first trip abroad. Uh, I liked it so much that the desire for adventure and for travel and so forth uh, was uh, irresistible and I wrote back to the CIA saying, I'm, I'm ready, I'd like to come in now. And uh, six months later, I was uh, in the CIA heading from headquarters in Washington down to Texas for one year's training in the Air Force. I came out of there with as a brand new uh, second lieutenant, went out to a fighter squadron in California, on a base in California, where I uh, was an intelligence officer for a year, then back to Washington to begin the CIA's year-long training program for operations officers. It's now the late summer of 1959. Well, the revolution had, uh, had succeeded, Batista had uh, flown into exile in the Dominican Republic on December 31st of 1958. And on the 1st of January, the celebrations of the triumph of the revolution began. The 1st of January, for ever since, has been the big ceremony uh, or celebration of the triumph every year on January 1st. These celebrations built up and built up and built up uh, at the beginning in January 1959 as Fidel and the other leadership across the island from town to town, city to city, from Oriente toward the west, toward Havana. And a week after uh, Batista had flown the country, uh, Fidel and the others arrived to a tumultuous reception and rally of support in Havana. It was the largest political rally ever seen in Cuba. And uh, as any Cuban will tell you uh, who was involved from that early period or who has studied the revolution, that was only the beginning. The easy part was the overthrow of Batista. The hard part was just about to start, meaning revolutionary development, turning out teachers to expand education, turning out doctors to expand the medical services, uh, defending from all of these attacks and aggression from the United States, which they, they knew perfectly well was coming. Uh, so the real struggle then began with the uh, uh, with the uh, taking over of power in uh, January 1959. And uh, that fall, I began this long training course, or this one-year training course. The first few months from September until the end of the year of 1959, we were all in Washington in CIA classrooms, studying the national security bureaucracy in uh, Washington, uh, the CIA structure and missions and so forth. And then in early January, we began our operational training, that is, how to run clandestine operations. And this was done at a secret CIA base, which until then had never been revealed as a CIA base. Uh, the cryptonym or code word for this base was isolation, and uh, everybody referred to it as the, uh, as the farm. It was, in fact, Camp Perry, supposedly a Navy base sprawling outside Williamsburg, Virginia, along the edge of a river. It was a strange base because it was divided, divided into all these uh, compartmented sections. There was an airstrip there. There was uh, an area for parachute training and uh, parachute drops and uh, air uh, resupply drops. There were areas for explosives training. There were gunnery ranges of, for all sorts of weapons. There was an area where there was a replica of an East European border 
with triple barbed wire fences and uh, uh, guard posts and dogs and uh, uh, electrified wire and so forth. Uh, there were all these different parts of it. And when we got down there, we were told we were not the only trainees at the base. We were a group of about 55, by the way, uh, for that year, um, of which there were, I think, about five only were women. Uh, that policy changed years later. A lot more women are brought in uh, now as operations officers. But then they were very few. We're down there beginning our operations training, and they tell us to ignore the uh, aircraft that are coming in and landing and taking off at odd hours of the night. Uh, there are these other trainees that uh, we will never meet and we will never see, and they will never see us. They are not to even to know that they are in the United States. And so don't throw out any, um, don't throw down any uh, cigarette wrappers, uh, packages, for example. Uh, in our area, we had classrooms, we had an officer's club, we had a baseball diamond, we had a gym for martial arts training, uh, and of course, uh, we went through this course for about seven months. While we were there, we were certain that these other trainees, some of them at least, were Cubans who were being trained to take action against Cuba because everybody knew that uh, the CIA had been called upon to, uh, to take action against Cuba. Uh, the relations had become strained from the very beginning between the United States and Cuba. Uh, they began with justice for the Batista murderers and torturers. This had been announced before Batista was ever overthrown. And they started with our guys, meaning the Brock people and the other security services uh, which were supported by the CIA under this Batista dictatorship. In fact, the repression got so bad uh, during the latter part of the Batista tyranny that in September 1958, uh, just before Batista was completely defeated, the inspector general of the CIA went down to Havana on a special trip to see the chief of BRAC. Uh, he had been one of the people earlier who had set up BRAC in 1956. And so he went down in 58 uh, to tell the chief of BRAC to start backing off to cool it, and uh, uh, especially on this question of political repression. Well, it didn't happen, and it got worse and worse. And by, finally, Batista had lost all of his political support, uh, everything that he had ever had. And that is one of the reasons why he completely, his regime collapsed. But um, in uh, January, the trials began. They were televised and they were public. And they were held in the sports coliseum or sports arena in, um, in Havana. It's, a, it's an indoor sports palace. And these were seen in the United States as uh, circus show trials. And uh, Wayne Morris, the, uh, the liberal from Oregon, got up in the uh, Senate and denounced them and called for an end to the Cuban bloodbath. He might have very well done it uh, on behalf of the CIA. Uh, but uh, the Cubans responded that they were going to continue until every last one of those uh, criminals was, uh, was uh, tried. Well, the chief of BRAC had gotten away. He had flown over to Miami and was safe. But the deputy chief was captured. And uh, this man had been the principal liaison officer of this uh, secret police, BRAC, with the CIA offices in the U.S. Embassy in Havana. And he was tried and sentenced to death. As soon as this sentence was passed, the CIA intervened with Che Guevara, went to Che and said, can you stop this death penalty or will you do this for us? Uh, they didn't do it directly, they did it through a third party. And Che said, we are going to execute this man for either of two reasons. One, that he's a murderer and a torturer or Two, that he is an agent of the United States. And he was executed the next morning. The CIA chief of station there in Havana, on hearing this, said, this is a declaration of war. And so that is the beginning of the Cuban problems with the United States, are the trials of these people who were involved in the political repression uh, before the overthrow of the Batista dictatorship. By March, only three months after the triumph of the revolution, and this is from the documentation that's come, that's, uh, that's now available, uh, the National Security Council and Eisenhower were discussing ways to overthrow this government and replace it with people who were more amenable to U.S. interests and U.S. desires. That's only three months after the triumph. Well, the CIA then was called upon to start training saboteurs, people in explosives, creating an underground uh, 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 
engaging in propaganda against the revolution. The main themes, of course, and they was, these, these were continued for years, was that the revolution had been betrayed, that Batista was uh, terrible, but the revolution itself had been betrayed, and eventually that it was taken over by communists and so forth. But uh, this is happening very early on, the very first year. And by the end of 1959, the CIA is uh, flying these, uh, what they call black overflights. They're illegal overflights with cargo planes, and they were dropping all sorts of supplies to a, uh, a growing um, rebellion or counter-revolutionary movement in the Escambray Mountains, which is this rugged mountain chain on the south central coast. This was before 1959 was over. Well, as I mentioned, that we were down at the uh, farm uh, by early 1960. And in March of that year, uh, we were down there three months, but in March of that year, 1960, Eisenhower signed the plan uh, which would lead to the Bay of Pigs catastrophe. And this was a plan to overthrow the revolution. It had four parts to it. Uh, one of them was to organize a unified political leadership outside Cuba. And this they did in Miami with the so-called Revolutionary Democratic Front the coordinator of which was uh, Tony de Verona, who had been the prime minister under the, in the Priol government overthrown by Batista in 52. Uh, they also were called upon to initiate propaganda uh, broadcasts and other act propaganda activities directed or targeted at Cubans in Cuba. One of the first projects or one of the first things that got going was Radio Swan. This was a transmitter on Swan Island, which is a Honduran possession in the Caribbean. And uh, it was full-time anti- uh, or counter-revolutionary propaganda, written all by the CIA. The, uh, the uh, corporation which uh, supposedly owned Radio Swan was based in New York City. It was called Gibraltar Steamship Corporation. Uh, never owned a boat, but it was just a simple front for the CIA for this operation. Uh, one of the other parts of this program was to recruit and train an invasion force, and uh, that became Brigade 2506. They were, tr uh, they were uh, recruited in Cuba and in Miami, about 2,000, taken to Guatemala, trained partly in Florida, and then taken to Guatemala to a special camp built for the purpose in the Western Highlands. And there they were trained uh, through 1960. In the summer of 1960, I finished that training course, and um, as there was so much emphasis on Latin America at the time because we were called upon in the CIA to, to break and to, uh, to neutralize the influence of the Cuban Revolution, which was so strong all over Latin America. In May of 1959, you know, Fidel announced one of the promises uh, from before, from the mountains, and that was agrarian reform. Agrarian, uh, land tenure, you know, uh, is the burning issue in Latin America. It has always been that way since the conquest. And uh, it is uh, known as the latifundia minifundia problem. Latifundia being the expansive properties, grazing lands and others, many times uh, large proportions of which are not even used. They lie fallow. Uh, these are owned by families or small, in uh, narrow uh, interests. The minifundia problem is the proliferation of small plots that are so small that they are economically unviable for families. And um, the rest of it is that there is a huge, huge uh, peasantry in Latin America that has no land at all. This is the burning question in Latin America because of the large peasant populations there who are marginalized uh, from the ordinary uh, lives of the country and who have no hope at all. Well, the Cubans had the same problem, and uh, in May 1959, with the first agrarian reform, they wiped out once and for all latifundia in Cuba. This affected U.S.-owned lands because the best and the biggest properties were U.S.-owned, and uh, that was an, another big step uh, toward problems with the United States. Um, it didn't wipe out private property by any means. It simply limited the uh, size of the properties that could be held by any one individual or, or company. And uh, it was generous, but it was a fraction of these huge ranches and other properties that were owned by the United States and by large, uh, by Cuban uh, large landowners. Uh, anyway, by, um, by um, the summer of 1960, when I was assigned to the Western Hemisphere Division, I was sent to the Venezuela desk, 
the policy was that any new trainee just out of the program had to spend a year at least in headquarters on uh, some kind of, like they considered it on the job training before you could be considered for an overseas, overseas posting. And naturally I was very eager and uh, wanted to go overseas as quickly as I could. But uh, to my surprise and to everybody else's surprise, all of my friends and the fellow classmates there, I was not even working one month in headquarters after the training program when I was called into the division chief's office and asked if I would like to take a job which was open down in uh, South America. Uh, of course, I could not say yes fast enough, and I went into full-time Spanish training. I had had tra uh, Spanish, as a matter of fact, in high school and college, but I went with a tutor full-time to uh, be able to take over agents uh, in uh, Ecuador. That was the country to which I was assigned as soon as I got down there. And I integrated to the Department of State as a U.S. diplomat, a Foreign Service officer. And uh, before the year was out, in uh, early uh, December 1960, I was down in Quito, Ecuador, in the U.S. Embassy, and I was taking over my first secret operations for the CIA. I was all of 25 years old. Well, down there at that time and into January and February, we knew that an invasion was coming, but we didn't know when. We were out of the loop in terms of the timing. Uh, in January of 1961, just as he was turning over the presidency to Kennedy, uh, Eisenhower broke diplomatic relations with um, uh, Cuba in, uh, anticipa in anticipation of the invasion. And he turned over the whole Cuban thing to, um, to uh, in fact, Nixon did it because Nixon was the point man in the Eisenhower administration on Cuba. And uh, the whole question was turned over to Kennedy. And uh, eventually, by April 15th, of, uh, or come April, it looked like it was going to be coming pretty quick because um, the uh, uh, Bloomingdale's of Havana, uh, a big department store called uh, El Encanto, a place where I had been, in fact, and visited uh, when I was there in 57, um, it burned to the ground. And um, there was other sabotage that was happening as a, uh, a way of uh, building up to the invasion. Uh, I'll go back for just a second on assassinations because in that summer of 1960, when I had finished the training course, the CIA began their efforts to assassinate Fidel Castro. It was under the March Eisenhower plan. And um, the plan was uh, to use the mafia you know, the Mafia had controlled all of the vice in Cuba. They had controlled the casinos and the numbers games and the drugs and the prostitution. And they had been driven out of Cuba by the revolution early on. They closed the casinos. They took 10 or 12,000 prostitutes off the streets and sent them to be trained in uh, textile manufacturing. And uh, so the Mafia had a lot to gain if it could get a, a toehold back in Cuba with the overthrow of the revolution. And so the CIA went to the Mafia, went to Sam Giancana in Chicago, the boss in Chicago, and his principal lieutenant, Johnny Rosselli, and also to Santos Traficante from my hometown in Tampa, who had controlled the, uh, he'd been in charge of the, all the stuff in Cuba. The CIA uh, gave some poison pills to Johnny Rosselli, who in turn gave them to Tony de Verona in Miami. He was the uh, coordinator of the political, uh, unified political front, the FDR, or FRD. And um, he, Verona, then gave them to some Cubans who were getting them, who were going to get them into Fidel's food at a restaurant where he and Raul, his brother, the number two person, and Che uh, ate from time to time. And uh, this was the trio, Fidel, Raul, and Che, who were the pre perennial candidates or targets for assassination by the CIA through many years, uh, for many years to come. Well, the plan was to assassinate Fidel on the eve of the invasion. And um, uh, it wasn't one of the absolute conditions for success, but that was the plan. Uh, of course, uh, they weren't able to carry it off. But on April 15th, we knew that it was ha coming because two B-26s, these are twin engine light bombers of World War II vintage, painted with the Cuban Air Force uh, symbols, landed in Florida, one in Key West and one in Miami. And there they claimed to be pilots defecting from the Cuban Air Force. They, in actual fact, were part of the Exile Air Force that the CIA had trained over in uh, Nicaragua. It was a period of the Somoza dictatorship, you know, and he did anything we asked. And so uh, the CIA set up a base at the Puerto Cabezas uh, airport, uh, 
Puerto Cabezas being the main Nicaraguan port on the Atlantic or Caribbean side. And this base was given the um, code name by the CIA, Happy Valley. And there they trained uh, Cuban pilots, uh, gave them about uh, 17 or 18 B-26s. They gave them some C-54 transport planes, and um, I think that was about the size of it. Uh, these defecting pilots had been part of a force of nine or 10 B-26s who raided the Cuban air bases to try to wipe out, uh, with the mission of wiping out Castro's Air Force, because one of the absolute conditions for success of this uh, invasion was going to be air superiority over the beach at the Bay of Pigs, which the, was the designated site for the landing. They were coming over in uh, six ships, six or so ships, and uh, they had to hold a beachhead for 72 hours. At the end of 72 hours, the CIA would fly in the political leadership. There was a small airstrip at the Bay of Pigs, and they would fly in the political leadership from Opalaca, a uh, small uh, marine base outside Miami. And the CIA had these people uh, 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 under arrest there, really. They were being held uh, incommunicado at the time of the uh, invasion. And they were to be flown in after 72 hours. They would declare a government in arms. They would be recognized, recognized by the United States. And then they would call on the US Marines for, or the United States for help. And that would come in the form of a Marine invasion. The Marines were on ships just across the horizon at the time. Well, <clears throat> the U-2 uh, photo photography from Sunday, the day after this April 15th raid, showed that they had not gotten all of the Cuban Air Force. Uh, they still had three, uh, I think, T-33 trainers with machine guns. They had about four British-made Sea Furies, which were single-engine light uh, fighter bombers. And they, I think they had one B-26 left. They had about eight planes left. I think over the first raid was so great, especially at the United Nations, it was totally transparent. Nobody believed that these were defectors from the Cuban Air Force that Kennedy did, could not stand the heat. He did not want to have the heat of another, another second raid prior to the invasion or the landing. He said they could, of course, fly close support uh, or support uh, once the landing had taken place. But this decision of Kennedy's was one of the principal reasons why the invasion was a total failure. In any case, by the time these, this first raid had occurred, the ships had already left Puerto Cabezas with the uh, invading force, about 1,500. Uh, strong. They had been flown from the base in Guatemala down to Puerto Cabezas where they got on the ships. And the ships were loaded with uh, weapons of all sorts, with provisions, everything they needed uh, for those 72 hours or so uh, coming up. The ships got to the uh, designated area uh, just after midnight on uh, April 17th, two days later, and about one o'clock in the morning the landing craft began to go ashore. Well, word got back to Havana and uh, Fidel uh, began sending large militia units and regular military toward the beach or toward that area. It was uh, surrounded by a very big swamp with only one road coming in. It was called the Cienega de Zapata. And uh, so it was going to be pretty easy to defend with the artillery pieces and the mortars and so forth that the um, invasion force had. But at the first light of dawn, the Cuban Air Force took off and they began sinking the ships. They sunk all the major ships, one of them with still a battalion of men on board, and um, all the major weapons and the provisions went to the bottom. And those ships that were not sunk were dispersed. And so this landing force of Brigade 2506 was left on the beach uh, alone. Within 72 hours, it was all over. Uh, the Cubans had taken, I think, around 1,400 prisoners, and uh, the whole thing was at an end. Kennedy, the next year, 1962, in December, ransomed. There had been negotiations from the time of the uh, Bay of Pigs on for ransom of the prisoners. And Kennedy had uh, finally sent a shipment of $52 million worth of medicines and uh, food to Cuba uh, for, the, um, for the ransom, and then the Cubans released these prisoners and they went back to the United States. And many of them carried on long careers in terrorism uh, of all sorts against, uh, against uh, Cuban interests uh, in various places, including the murder of Cuban diplomats, including the bombing, bombing of the Cubana airliner in 1976 uh, with 73 people aboard, all of whom perished. <clears throat> 
Well, uh, I was in Ecuador at the time, and uh, I don't have enough time to go into all the things we did. But our job, our fundamental purpose there was to isolate the Cuban Revolution by inducing countries throughout Latin America or forcing them when necessary to break diplomatic and commercial relations with Cuba and to take uh, repressive action against Cuba's supporters in whatever country it happened to be. And in Ecuador, we uh, fomented the overthrow of a government which was elected in 1960. It was overthrown in November of 1961 uh, because the president would not break with Cuba. The vice president came in and he too would not break with Cuba. So in early 1962, we organized, we were, we were, our propaganda barrages were constant and overwhelming. But these presidents refused. And uh, so we organized a series of bombings of churches in early 1962, of Catholic churches, the most important ones around the country. First there would be one here and then one there. And we always left behind uh, people. This was done through right-wing political uh, groups that were working with us. Uh, we left behind propaganda from Cuba's main youth support group in Ecuador, the Revolutionary Union of, of Ecuadorian Youth. And um, the bombs were not uh, very strong. They were noise bombs. They didn't do much damage. But they were perfect for creating headlines and for then uh, bringing mass uh, demonstrations out onto the streets in support of the Catholic Church and against Cuba. And uh, <clears throat> we fomented these bombings <coughs> excuse me, in various uh, places, the major cities. And they culminated in March 1962 with the uh, bomb at the house, the residence of the Cardinal in Quito. Uh, he, of course, was not sleeping there that night. Um, but that, too, um, was headlines. And um, we financed one of the largest demonstrations in the history of the capital city, Quito, uh, through the political parties on the right. Uh, they sent out trucks and buses and brought in campesinos by the tens of thousands. And, um, uh, what happened, what we knew would happen, did happen. The uh, main garrison in the south of the country at Cuenca revolted, and they gave the president 72 hours to break with Cuba. Uh, he preferred, the president preferred uh, the pres presidential palace over exile in Panama, and so he broke with Cuba. And we had achieved what we were uh, after. Uh, this same president, though, refused to uh, apply repression to the left uh, even following the break with Cuba. And so we kept up all of these operations against him, a whole series of provocative uh, provocations in uh, 1963, leading to another overthrow of the government. And this time we got what we wanted, which was a uh, military junta and a military dictatorship. Within days of that, all of these supporters of Cuba and everybody on the left, hundreds of people were arrested and in, in jail, in prison. Um, after the Bay of Pigs, it's interesting to know, it's important to know, in fact, that um, Kennedy decided to continue the war against Cuba. Uh, right after the Bay of Pigs uh, disaster, Kennedy appointed, appointed an, a commission to investigate what had gone wrong under General Maxwell Taylor, his principal military advisor at the time. And Taylor issue, issued his report in June of 1961, in which it concluded, or he concluded and the whole committee concluded, that the United States cannot in the long run live with the Cuban Revolution as a neighbor. New ways have got to be found to overthrow the revolution. And so the CIA and other agencies uh, formed a committee to write up a new plan, which Kennedy approved in November 1961, just as this first overthrow in Ecuador was happening. And uh, that became known as Operation Mongoose. The man chosen to lead it was General Edward Lansdale who had become a legend in the CIA for his work in the Philippines and in Vietnam. He had uh, been sent to Vietnam to put down the Huk Rebellion in the early 1950s. And the Huk Balahops were the principal resistance movement to the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. They were communists. And uh, they laid down their weapons and went into uh, uh, politics after the war and were elected to the uh, Philippine legislature in 1946, but they were not allowed to take their seats. And political repression began against them, just as a very similar thing happened in Greece and other places, Korea, South Korea. And um, 
So they took to the hills again and began the armed struggle. It was fairly successful in uh, central Luzon, and Lansdale was sent in to put it down, and he did. He was very successful. And his man, uh, Ramon Magsaysay, was elected president. I mean, he got him elected. He was the CIA man, and they bought the elections for him uh, in 1953. Lansdale was then sent to Vietnam to create popular support and a sort of a functioning country out of South Vietnam that had resulted from the temporary partition of Vietnam in 1954, which the United States made permanent. He tried to form a political party for support to the Jim regime and all of these different operations with women's organizations, with media, with police, and so forth, and they failed. And the failure of those secret CIA operations, Michigan State University, by the way, was one of the principal factors there in training a, a police force in the 1950s in South Vietnam. That was the cover. Uh, in any case, they failed, and the failure was what required the introduction of military advisors in Vietnam and then eventually the entire army of more than 500,000. Very important to remember that the Vietnam War came on the heels of failed CIA secret covert operations in Vietnam. Well, in Cuba, this Operation Mongoose continued the assassination plots against Fidel Castro and Raul and Che and um, called for the overthrow of the, another invasion and the overthrow of the uh, Cuban government and revolution by October 1962. This was the date in the plan. And the Cubans, who had known everything about the Bay of Pigs practically, they had so effectively infiltrated the exile community, they had excellent intelligence and security services. We respected them highly because of their level of effectiveness. Uh, they had been working in this since the, practically since Moncada, and so they were uh, they were services which were highly effective. Uh, the person responsible for that was Ramiro Valdez, who was the Minister of the Interior for, for more than 15 years. Anyway, uh, uh, they knew about this plan to overthrow the revolution by October 1962, and that is exactly what brought on the missile crisis, because they went to the Soviets, and the Soviets agreed to put intermediate-range nuclear missiles in Cuba as a defense against this uh, coming assault from the United States. And that is what led, of course, to the missile crisis of October 1962 and the only time that the world has come really very close within a hair of nuclear conflagration. Uh, there's another example of what happens from these covert operations. Well, uh, I had, um, I had um, come back to the United States for home leave at the end of 1963. I was transferring down to uh, Uruguay, where I would be in charge of Cuban operations. And it was the station's highest priority there. The Uruguayans had refused to break diplomatic relations with Cuba. And uh, I went down there in uh, April, just as the CIA's operations to overthrow the uh, civilian government in Brazil uh, 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 succeeded. And there, there was a t from that on, there was a, that time on, there was a 20-year military dictatorship institutionalization of torture and so forth in uh, Brazil, political assassinations and so forth. Uh, within six months of my arrival in um, Ecuador, I mean of uh, Uruguay, we had uh, engineered the break in diplomatic, diplomatic relations between Uruguay and Cuba. In that year, 1964, we succeeded in what we had set out to do in 1959, that is, bring about the break of di diplomatic relations with Cuba by every Latin American country. There was only one exception, and that was Mexico. Mexico is the only country that never broke with Cuba. We carried on all kinds of other activities against Cuba, recruiting their people for when they came through there. I recruited, for example, a member of the Cuban National Sugar Board. And from Cuba, he reported to us on everything about the crop, about the planting, about the uh, growth, about the harvest, about their marketing uh, activities abroad. And we could, of course, take steps all along the way. It's getting to be 9.15, and I don't think I should go on very much longer, but I do want to mention that biological warfare was another thing used against Cuba. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, the uh, Cuba, Fidel survived, as we all know, these assassination attempts. The early, the, uh, the investigation by the Senate of the CIA in the mid-1970s under Frank Church, the Democrat of Iowa, uh, Idaho, uh, came up with eight different 
CIA assassination plots against Fidel uh, through the 60s, I think. But the Cuban government itself has presented the United States government with the evidence of more than 30 assassination plots through 1987. So they were continuing off and on all through the years. Uh, Johnson, oh, one thing uh, that people should know also, I think uh, make a mental note of this, uh, in uh, late November 1963, um, Kennedy sent a friend of his, Jean Daniel, the editor of Nouvelle Observateur. It's a magazine published in Paris. It's kind of like a French new, uh, newsweek. He sent him to, uh, as a secret emissary to Fidel to discuss ways in which relations with the United States, between the, between the United States and Cuba, might be relaxed and improved, a kind of a uh, limited detente. Uh, he had made this decision during the course of 1963, following the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Jean Daniel was sitting in Fidel's office discussing this when the person, the staff person, came in with the first news for Fidel that Kennedy had been assassinated. That very same day, November 22, 1963, the CIA in Paris, and this was Desmond Fitzgerald, a man I knew who was one of the highest officials in the, in the Cuban operations of the uh, Cuban task force, he passed a murder weapon to a Cuban whose name was Rolando Cubella in Paris. It was a hypodermic syringe disguised as a, a ballpoint pen, and uh, it was to be loaded with a poison called Blackleaf 40, and this man, Cubella, had access to Fidel. He had been a uh, student leader, and he was an official in the government with access to Fidel. He was to uh, stick him with this pin, uh, with this hypodermic. And uh, uh, he never did it, of course, but he was eventually caught and sentenced, I believe, to 30 years in prison. He was to be executed, and Fidel personally intervened because he had, they had been friends. And uh, he had got 30 years instead of, uh, of uh, the Paredon. But anyway, uh, that is uh, something which um, I think reflects or, or touches on the Kennedy assassination. In any case, uh, Johnson, when he came into uh, office, uh, made the remark that he had not known that we were carrying on a murder incorporated in the Caribbean. And he, in fact, stopped these assassination attempts against Fidel, uh, partly, I guess, because of the Kennedy assassination. But then they were started up again by Nixon who also started again, or started meteorological warfare against Cuba. They seeded clouds over non-agricultural areas, causing downpours so that there would be no rain over the cane fields. Uh, uh, there was also biological warfare at that time. I was in Cuba on my first trip to Cuba uh, following my resignation from the CIA in 1968. And if anybody wants to know, just ask me during the discussion period about what happened to me and why I left. And uh, my ideas changed so uh, dramatically. But uh, in uh, 1971, I was in Cuba when the Cubans were slaughtering uh, more than 500,000 pigs. And uh, pork is one of the main sources of protein in the Cuban diet. But the CIA had introduced African swine fever that year, and uh, it spread all over the island. African swine fever, the first outbreak in the Western Hemisphere in this century. And it was a CIA operation under Nixon. Uh, Nixon uh, reinitiated the assassination plots against Fidel. Uh, he had, of course, been, as I mentioned, the man who um, supervised the anti-Cuban operations during uh, the end of the Eisenhower administration. Well, we all know that the uh, Cuban operations of the CIA boomeranged on Nixon because they were CIA-trained people who were arrested burgling the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate complex in Washington. Uh, and so Nixon, you know, uh, you remember he was so paranoid that he bugged himself. And uh, when the courts finally pried loose those tapes, there was Nixon telling Haldeman, his chief of staff, right after the break-in and the arrest, we've got to keep this contained, we've got to cover this up. It all leads back to the Bay of Pigs, meaning Nixon's connections with the assassination of plots, uh, plots and the mafia. He had other connections with the mafia through B.B. Raboso and, and other of, others of his cronies. Uh, so that is why he uh, decided he had to cover it up. And uh, that eventually cost him his presidency. Uh, Ford continued these activities. 
he had George Bush as his CIA chief during Bush's watch. Orlando Letelier was assassinated on Embassy Row in Washington. He had been the Chilean ambassador under Allende to Washington. He had also been Chilean defense minister for a while. And he was the leader of the Chilean ex exile community in the United States. Uh, his car was blown up, and uh, Cuban exiles trained by the CIA were involved in it. And of course, a week later, no, two weeks later, the uh, Cubana airliner was bombed after it had taken off from uh, Barbados on its way back to Havana. Uh, that was Ford and Bush. Then under Carter, uh, things relaxed, and um, Carter allowed the Cubans to establish a diplomatic mission in Washington, and US, the State Department established an intersection in Havana for the first time since Eisenhower had broken in 1961. These were not official embassies. They were sections of other embassies, of the Swiss embassy in, technically speaking, it was the United States intersection of the Swiss embassy in Havana. In Washington, technically, it was the Cuban intersection of the Czech embassy. But in fact, uh, they were de facto embassies carrying on all the functions of that an embassy does. And um, as an example, well, continuing with Carter, and I'll get to this other point. Continuing with Carter, uh, relations were relaxed. The, he lifted the travel ban. But in 1979, the Republicans got all over him, led by this senator, this right-wing uh, ideologue from Florida, Senator Stone, uh, who made a big thing of a supposed sudden discovery of a Soviet combat brigade in Cuba. Some of you will remember that. The existence of this brigade in Cuba was known since the Missile Crisis, but the Republicans made a thing about it, and Carter was forced uh, to, to um, harden relations with Cuba. And that is when the big military buildup began. Remember that Reagan simply continued and uh, augmented, and um, that was with the uh, Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. But anyway, relations with Cuba again soured. And of course, when Reagan and Bush came in in 1981, they got even worse. And uh, we know, all know, the latest outrage in this 35-year uh, war against Cuba is the Torricelli Bill, in which the United States has passed a law in which we presume to control and influence the, uh, regulate the trade of other countries, basically. Because that law makes it a crime for any US-based, that is, any US any subsidiary of a U.S.-based multinational corporation, GM, GE, whatever, it makes it a crime for them to deal with Cuba, uh, to trade with Cuba. And these subsidiaries of U.S. companies had been trading with Cuba all along, despite the, the economic blockade, and the trade was worth something like seven or $800 million to Cuba before the law was passed. Uh, it happened that Bush, knowing it was against international law, was against it. But candidate Clinton, in the spring of 1992, was running out of money. In fact, he had run out of money. And he was hard up to continue the primary campaign. And so he goes down to Miami, and he makes public statements uh, with the right-wing Cubans around the Cuban National Foundation, Cuban American National Foundation, Jorge Mas, and that group of, uh, of uh, quasi-Nazis. And uh, uh, he came out very strongly in favor of the Torricelli bill, which had not been passed yet. The Cubans gave him $100,000, I believe. And uh, so he was able to continue with that Cuban money. And he's beholden to the uh, Cubans now. Uh, it was eventually passed by Congress, and George Bush signed it into law, despite the fact that he was uh, against it. Canada has passed a law making it a crime for any person in Canada to adhere to that US law. Uh, the Mexicans have done the same. The British have come out saying, we will react very strongly to any a British chartered company that adheres to US law. And so have the French and various others. Uh, so it has limited appeal to our closest allies. But in any case, it's passed. And that is the latest outrage. I wanted to mention to you something about the effectiveness of the Cuban intelligence and, intelligence and security services. Uh, they have been very effective all through the years. But uh, one of the, uh, let's say, the most effective and uh, moving um, demonstration of their effectiveness occurred in the summer of 1987. Uh, in early July, the Cuban Foreign Ministry delivered a diplomatic note to the U.S. intersection in Havana, uh, saying that they were beginning that day an 11-part television series on subversive operations and espionage run out of the very intersection in Havana. Uh, 
And so there was this 11 part series starting in early July on these operations run out of the intersection. There were 27 Q, uh, agents whom the CIA were running from the intersection, believing they were working for the CIA, where in actual fact they had been working for Cuban security from the very beginning. 26 Cubans and one Italian. The average number of years that these people had been working for the CIA, for the Cubans, was 15 years. One had worked for them for 21 years. And all of them had passed the uh, lie detector test various times. The programs were interviewed with interviews with these people, telling about the experiences, what they were called upon to do, how much money they were paid, and so forth. But they were interspersed with film clips from hidden cameras of the American diplomats, or the CIA men, really, from the U.S. intersection there, uh, servicing dead drops. And for example, they had one uh, a man with his wife with a picnic, picnic basket on a Sunday morning, going out and uh, parking their car in a, an isolated spot. And they get out of the car, they look all around, they carry the picnic, picnic basket over into a, a very heavily uh, uh, vegetated area. And uh, then they plant, uh, they, uh, they bury stuff in there, communications equipment, I think it was that time. And then they come back with picnic, ba picnic basket, they look all around, they get back in the car and they go off. And all this stuff was uh, filmed. Uh, they had uh, hours of it uh, from hidden cameras. And so they got these CIA people on film doing these things. Uh, I want to give you the, the, the um, uh, reaction of the United States to this, uh, this series. Uh, <clears throat> the State Department replied uh, about a week after this series started with a diplomatic note which said, this program is, and this is a quote from the diplomatic note, another manifestation of the hostile environment which the, gov which the government of Cuba has created for United States diplomatic representatives in Havana. This, the statement went on to denounce these programs as, quote, outrageous, unwarranted surveillance, and that the uh, people identified in the programs, another quote, have been subjected to irreparable harm through this public slander. The government of the United States will hold the government of Cuba strictly accountable if these quote unquote revelations should lead to any violence against the persons whose names and reputations have been so recklessly abused. In particular, the security of the seven people who are still in Havana. Because there were seven people still working in the intersection who were in these films uh, taken secretly. Anyway, that's the same kind, sort, of, uh, sort of ridiculous, uh, outrageous uh, indignation that they showed last week, isn't it, uh, when the, uh, the Aldrich Ames case uh, came out. Uh, they could not believe that the Russians would do such a thing to the United States as to defend themselves. Yeah, totally, 100% defensive, you know. That was no aggressive act toward the United States. They were getting information about what the United States was doing to screw them, the Russians, right? And the United States is so indignant. I could not believe it when I saw those calls in Congress for an end to um, aid. Well, I'm going to end here and simply mention this, that we all know, or I hope you know, that Cuba is going through a, what they call a special period for the last four or five years. Their capacity to import has collapsed. It's d dropped by 80 percent. Their transportation, public transportation, has been cut back by 70 percent. Their industry is operating at less than 50 percent capacity. They are practically in a calamitous way there and now. And uh, that is all the more reason why they need our support and our solidarity. They are going through this period, though, with every indication that they're going to survive. You know, they have not had to close one single clinic. One of the great achievements is that they have more doctors per capita than any other country in the world. They have more teachers than any other country of the world per capita, and they have not to, had to close one school. The result, I could not believe it, in 1993, despite this calamity, they were able to redu reduce infant mortality from 10.2 to 9.4. That is deaths of 1,000 live births. That's one of the main indicators, you know, of public health. And that is at a par with the United States and all the developed world. And they do this on a per capita annual income of $1,500, according to the CIA's World Factbook for 1993-1994. $1,500 compared to $22,500 in 
per capita income for the United States. And in their life expectancy right now, a male born has a life expectancy in Cuba of, nine, of uh, 74 years. United States, 72 years. Women in Cuba, 79. Women in the United States, 79 too. So they have been uh, successful, certainly compared to the rest of Latin America, and you cannot take them out of that context. The Cuban Revolution and what's happened in Cuba and their form of government and so forth has got to be considered, I think, always within the context of Latin America. Well, uh, the other aspect of my trip here now, and uh, this, is, um, this is the last thing I want to say, is that I am inviting you, I'm inviting people all over, to come to Cuba in June, the last week of June, on the next travel challenge organized by Global Exchange. My, my uh, tour just now has been organized uh, in part by Global Exchange in San Francisco. Uh, Tony Newman is now going to speak to you about what Global Exchange is all about and what they're doing. But uh, they are sending people to Cuba in defiance of the ban on travel to Cuba. They sent a group in October, which he will tell you about, and I am going to be on the group that, with the group that goes in, um, in late June, the last week of June. I'll fly directly from uh, Germany to, uh, uh, from Hamburg to uh, Havana. And um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tony Newman, and I want to thank you all very, very much for coming out here on Friday night and for your attention. Thank you very much.